I don't know if I got the, what the grade is. There's so many. It depends on what you want out of your life, right? But I think the ability to manage your own mind and emotions is probably one of the single most important. And maybe the second is the ability to influence others because that's what makes you a leader. Mm. And hopefully you're doing that for a higher good because <laughs> there are all kinds of leaders, as you know. But I think, I don't think most people are very good at, at emotional fitness. Most people are just not as happy as they could be. You know, I did one book, Money Master the Game. Of it's kind of like this. Yes. Well, only and what I did in that case is I interviewed you know fifty of the smartest financial people in the world yes. Ray Dalio, Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett, and out of fifty of them, and I, you know again it's in my judgment I could be completely wrong, and I've spent a lot of time with them. Some have become really good friends. There's probably four or five that are really happy people. You go, oh, well, money makes people unhappy. You know, money, it has nothing to do with money. Money makes you more of what you are. It just magnifies. If you're mean, you have more to be mean with. If you're kind, you have more to give. You know, but I think that most people are just. They haven't learned to manage what's going inside. Doesn't matter how much abundance they have, they're still unhappy. We've all seen people that, great comedians that have killed themselves. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, beautiful man, traveled the world, killed himself, you know, um, you know, fashion designers that have done it. We've all seen all these different people, Kate Spade. And it's like, what? They had everything, except they didn't master what's going on here and here. And, mm -hmm. and you know, this is why you lived your life the way you have as, as well. So I think. That skill set is the most important one. That's why even in the book, my last two chapters, I think are the most important because it's really about the power of the mind. Because mm. like everybody knows about placebos, right? Mm -hmm. They were only discovered in World War II and it was discovered by accident. This doctor ran out of morphine and he's treating these, these people that are mm -hmm. badly injured. And you know, you need the morphine not just so they're out of pain, but so they don't go into shock. Mm -hmm. And the actual person who discovered this who gets no credit was a nurse, because the nurse handed him a syringe and said, We've got some more morphine. So he believed it and he said, You'll be out of pain in just less than a minute. Wow. He injected them, and in every case, none of them went into shock. 90% of them were out of pain and they used nothing. It was saline, right? So after World War II, he went back to Harvard and he was the person that created what we now consider to be the double bind studies, which are always compared to a placebo, right? And what most people don't know is the bigger the placebo intervention, the more powerful the mind believes it. Mm. So a small pill is less effective than a big pill. <laughs> um, an injection is more powerful than a pill in terms right. of its effectiveness. The most powerful is a, is a sham surgery. The Veterans Administration did a study and they did on people doing knee surgeries and they took one third of the people and they just cut them open, anesthetized them, and sewed them back up, did nothing. A year later, this group, the group that had no surgery, had the least amount of pain, the most amount of flexibility, the most amount of, so they stopped funding those surgeries to give you an idea. But that's how powerful it is. Mm. And so when you, it's even more than Harvard did a study where they took barbiturates, made these big red pills, and said, this is an amphetamine, you need to prepare your body because you're gonna speed up. They didn't give them something fake, they gave them an actual drug that slows the body down and the body sped up. So most people don't understand the power of the mind. And so what I try to do is show people, even in this book, here are the things that you can do to take control of your mind. Because if you take care of your body and then you don't take care of your mind and emotions, you're gonna be miserable. Yeah. Who cares? Absolutely. Yeah. What sparked that question was something you said. You said that you start your morning by jumping in the cold. That's right. And you never feel like doing it. And you said that, I just say to my body, it's time to go. That's right. And that's what sparked the question because I was like, that's a really interesting skill that yes. you've trained yourself to be okay with discomfort. Yes. You're training yourself as your first skill of the day is, yes. I am okay with uncomfortable things. Yes. And I know I can get through them. Yes. And that to me is what sounds like a really important part of emotional fitness. It is, because unless you can push through discomfort, most things that are gonna give you the greatest reward require discomfort initially, Yeah. right? And the discomfort, it's like, you know, my original teacher, Jim Rohn, used to always say, you know, there's two pains in life, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Mm. He goes, discipline weighs ounces, regret weighs tons, you know? And <laughs> yeah, so well I've, I've trained myself to do that. And then, and then I meditate, then I always make an acknowledgement call briefly or leave a voicemail for someone just because to spark the day. And then I do the first thing I do is always whatever is the most difficult. Yes. Because then you have momentum for your day. And when you train your brain to do what's difficult first, then emotional fitness just comes naturally. And more importantly, so does achievement. So does your ability to contribute to other people. Negative mindset is going to have an overall impact on your mental health. So anxiety is the easiest one to talk about because I've experienced it, but I think depression is also going to be um, hugely affected by what you allow yourself to repeat. So one core mechanism of the brain is to understand that 
while we are a very active species that's meant to go out and explore and master our environment, there is a secondary evolutionary force pushing on us, which is that we also want to conserve calories to make sure that we survive um, a famine. So we have this dual competing thing of wanting to go out and do cool shit, hence the big dreams, and wanting to sit on the couch and eat a bag of potato chips, uh, hence why we procrastinate, why we feel lazy. And the way that the brain as a physiological organ has dealt with this dual impulse challenge over evolutionary timeframes is that it's a process called myelination. And what that does is it's wrapping fatty tissue around neurons that fire together at the same time frequently. So this is why they say neurons that fire together wire together. They are literally getting optimized for the efficient transmission of the signals across those synaptic gaps. And the reason that they do this is that it becomes easier from a caloric perspective to do those things. So now you've made whatever you repeat, whether it's something empowering or disempowering, whether it's something that makes you anxious or feel like you can do anything, it's going to make thinking those thoughts and feeling those feelings easier from a caloric perspective. It also begins to move it into what's called the default mode network. So the default mode network is responsible for anything that we'll call automatic thinking. If you've done something a bazillion times, you don't think about brushing your teeth, you just brush your teeth. You don't think about driving to work oftentimes, certainly before the pandemic, you just drive to work. And there were times where you would show up at work and be like, whoa, I almost don't remember the journey getting here. And the reason is that what ends up happening is your cognition can be put onto basically something else. So you're thinking through daydreaming, whatever. And the thing that you do in a repetitive way is just happening automatically, super efficiently. And uh, it's a thing that happens to the brain where you can scan somebody and go up, oh, they're in the default mode network right now. And if worry, anxiety, panic, fear, stress, if that's what you're doing all the time, then that's what's gonna be moved over made calorically easier to do, uh, moved into the default mode network so that by default, that's where you go. And this is where most people spend the majority of their lives is living in that default mode network of these emotions that they've created these very well-worn paths to looping around over and over to feeling those feelings over and over. And so you can understand since the body responds to your the mental states that you're constantly in, that each of those mental states is characterized by hormonal and neurochemical states, and the body will have different long-term consequences based on what you're feeling. So for instance, if you are constantly stressed or ang uh, constantly anxious, your cortisol levels are extraordinarily high. Cortisol levels begin to damage the elasticity of your blood vessels. It's one of the vectors of attack on your body. And so you don't want to stay in these chronically elevated levels because it deteriorates the integrity of the lining of your blood vessels. And this is the kind of thing that leads to stroke or coronary heart disease. So being incredibly thoughtful, not to loop on those things, which doesn't mean that there aren't bad things going on in your life, but it does mean that when you allow yourself to loop, 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 that there is this hormonal and chemical cascade as a response to that, that your body will have negative consequences to or positive consequences if you're in a loving, calm state a lot. And that's the thing that becomes the default mode network. That becomes the easiest thing for you to think. And you're in this really calm and creative state a lot of times, uh, then you're gonna prolong your life. So I, I hesitate only to say that because of course there are other extenuating circumstances like if your diet is terrible, uh, but you're in that calm and creative state a lot, I think you're still gonna run into issues. And quite honestly, if your diet is messed up, then the odds of you being able to stay in that calm and creative state are very, very low because of the communication that happens between your brain and your gut. Getting into dysbiosis is a whole nother thing. But anyway, you wanna be very careful the things that you allow yourself to think. Now, how do you train yourself to get out of that get out of a negative default mode network and into a positive default mode network. So one is something called pattern interrupting. This comes from cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, it's extraordinarily useful and I highly encourage you guys to get very deft at this. And this is simply not allowing yourself to think certain thoughts. And every time you catch yourself doing it to pattern interrupt and you remind yourself, you don't do that. 
So for instance, one of the reasons that I don't get overwhelmed is because I don't allow myself to be overwhelmed. That doesn't mean that I can carry an infinite load. What it means is every time I can feel that escalation, I can feel like, oh my God, this is overwhelming. I say to myself, ah, you don't do overwhelm. And saying that thought interrupts that pattern and breaks me out of it, brings my conscious control back in, right? Viktor Frankl, between stimulus and response, there is a gap. We want to mind that gap. We want to get in there, insert something like this statement, I don't do overwhelm, which then puts me back into conscious control and I decide what I want to insert in terms of the emotion that I want to feel, which of course is more calm, more relaxed, able to handle more things. Now, I also remind myself that doing less is always an option. So if there's just too many things happening at once, 99 times out of 100, even if I'm really in something busy and there's a lot happening, if I feel overwhelm coming on, boom, pattern interrupt, I don't do overwhelm, and then I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna deep breathe from my belly, and I'm gonna slow things down. And I'm gonna let that stuff go, and that's exactly how I'm actually able to end up doing more because I don't let that become a runaway process. I pattern interrupt it, I breathe from my diaphragm, I slow down, it doesn't take long to reset, to get yourself focused, and then typically what I'll do at that point is shift back into an aggressive mental and emotional posture, which then helps me push through anything that might potentially feel overwhelming. And that is the training. So you're doing that pattern interrupt. You're doing the physiological things that you need to do to shift your state. And then you're inserting yourself back into that gap and you do that over and over and over and over, never wasting time being angry with yourself that you start to feel overwhelmed, but instead being proud of yourself that you do the pattern interrupt, that you slow things down. And when you reinforce that behavior, that's what begins to wire together. And now over time, it becomes this very easy loop that happens automatically. You don't even think about it. When you start to feel that sense of overwhelm, you don't get lost in the overwhelm. Boom, you stop, slow down, breathe, insert the aggression in this case. I'm just giving you an example from how I deal with it, but whatever you're gonna do to deal with it. I do something exactly uh, similar to that for anxiety. I start to feel the anxiety build up. Ah, I'm not going to allow that to become this runaway process. I'm going to slow down. It happens again that I'm gonna breathe from my diaphragm. I'm going to relax. I'm gonna close my eyes. I'm gonna start some sort of visualization of things going well instead of going wrong. You only get anxious when you imagine things going wrong. So now I'm going to force myself to imagine them going well I'm gonna breathe from my diaphragm doing the physiological work of making sure I'm shifting state and just do that over and over and over.